I'm gonna start out with a disclaimer, a couple things. This is not a smooth bore versus fog talk. If you came looking for that, that's not what it is. It is not a manufacturer against another talk. Every major nozzle manufacturer out there makes a great product, and they all make comparable products to what we're gonna talk about today. So I'm not gonna use one over another. And this is not how the FDNY or insert other big department here does it. This talk is all about nozzle reaction. That's what it is. So I'm gonna ask you a question, I'm gonna challenge you here. How is the two and a half inch line viewed in your department? So think about when you've seen it used at a fire. Do you, is your department, does your organization view it as a defensive line? Something you only pull when a warehouse is on fire, the pallet yard, buildings are going to the ground, you see these two brothers sitting on it, one's got his coat off, you know. Is that how you use your two and a half? Or does your department view it as a fighting line? Do your company officers look at choosing the two and a half as an option equally with using a small diameter inch and a half or inch and three quarter? Okay? If they don't view it as a fighting line, well, why is that? And we're going to get into it. Um, you've heard UL, the NIST, you've heard those studies talked about a lot today. Um, our fire environment is changing. You're hearing that over and over. We're all saying that for a reason because it's true. So when we talk about, well, why use a two and a half? I mean, we pull inch and three quarters on probably nine out of every 10 structure fires we go to and they work great, fires go out. So why would I want to pull a two and a half on a house fire? You know, your typical residential box alarm. Well, it's a couple reasons. One, houses are getting bigger, right? The average house, you know, is, is pushing 4,000, 5,000 square feet. Uh, in, in my first do, um, we're seeing these McMansions popping up. I'm at the coast, right, 7,000. 8,000, 9,000 square foot houses, that's a commercial building, right? Some of these houses are bigger than a strip mall when you look at the volume, right? You have open spaces, we talked about great rooms, right? That large, uncompartmentalized fire. Uh, Ed, I thought, gave a great talk about the involving fuel loads and uh, heat release rate and how that affects us. And voids, you know, for years, We've been told that truss construction is all a collapse thing, right? I mean, everybody knows about gusset plates and gang nails, right? And how these truss roofs are going to collapse on us. The next time you see a house being built in your first due with trusses, just look at it from the thought process of how much lumber, i.e. fuel, is going into that house and what's the surface area of that fuel. So in legacy construction, if you looked at a legacy attic, right, where you had two by uh, sixes, maybe two by eights, okay, up there, where you had one two by eight, where by weight, most of the surface area was inside the beam, right? Now we replace that with maybe six two by four trusses in its place with small dimensional lumber. So I've exponentially increased the surface area of the fuel that's able to pyrolyze and be liberated for gases. You know, and then we throw our sheathing on there. You know, attic, large attic fires can produce heat comparable to, again, a commercial fire. The building materials are changing. Smaller lots. Um, a lot of folks here, the brothers from Clackamas and stuff can tell you. Um, density housing, it's real popular here in the Portland area. It's going back to the row houses you know, that you see on the East Coast that our, our brothers and sisters fight, you know, back in faces like Philly, D.C., Baltimore, right? We've all seen those pictures of a whole block of row houses on fire in Baltimore. Mark my words, it's a matter of time until one morning you wake up and you see a whole block of row houses on fire in Clackamas, in Northeast Portland, in Sandy, in any of these small communities. You're going to see fires that we always thought were big inner city fires, they're coming to a town near you because we're building the same buildings in your small town. I love adults, okay? When do we use the two and a half inch line? I think this is great because it's as true today as when it was written, okay? Advanced fire on arrival. You pull up, it's coming out the front door, it's coming out the front windows, it's going to town on you. We talked about the defensive mode. Uh, undetermined location, extent of fire. You have a 7,000 square foot house. 
you pull up and fire is coming out of some of the attic vents on one portion of the roof. Commercial buildings, what do the attics have to be? Every certain amount of square feet. Compartmentalized, right? They usually have to have drywall in there, okay? Residential structures, yeah, maybe, maybe not, right? So you could have this huge open, remember that picture of those trusses, that could conceivably all of it be involved with fire, some of it, or maybe some of it now and eventually all of it by the time you get in there and start working, that meets that. Those large uncompartmented areas. We need tons of water and standpipes. You know, I'm gonna tell you, if you say all of our high rises are new, they're post 93, they're all residential and they're all sprinklered. So we're gonna use inch and three quarter high rise packs, right, okay? Google, after this presentation, Google the Cosmopolitan Hotel fire in Las Vegas, Nevada. Modern high rise, fully protected with all the, the systems. You know, MGM Grand, right, the Las Vegas Metro has some of the strictest fire codes in the nation, okay? Look at that fire and look what those guys faced on that pool deck I believe it was the 13th floor in a fully sprinkled building, okay? The volume of fire they were facing in the Cosmopolitan Hotel, okay? And then think, do I wanna be leading off a standpipe with an inch and three quarter? Because it's light. This talk is about reaction force. And again, I'm not picking on any deal. This happens to be an Akron assault model. This chart, and this is from uh, Captain Dennis Laguerre, right, who was just here. Uh, this is from his Nozzle Dreams part one and two. I highly recommend reading that along with Hose Dreams. So what has Dennis told us? Dennis told us that whether or not a hand line is controllable boils down to one thing and one thing only, and that is the level of nozzle reaction force. He also tells us there's no variation of these characteristics depending on manufacture. It is physics. It would be true for a smoothbore nozzle or any other manufacturer. So Dennis tells us that 100 PSI nozzle pressure when used to generate flows of 250 to 300 gallons a minute produces a harsh, unforgiving, and unacceptably high nozzle reaction. Think about that. Think about every time you've used a two and a half with a 100 PSI fog nozzle, does harsh, unforgiving, and high nozzle reaction come to mind? It does for me. So why is low pressure superior, okay? Because if I take, I'm gonna go back a slide here. If I take that 250 at 100 PSI fog nozzle, I pump it at 100 PSI flowing 250 gallons a minute, right? Standard two and a half target flow. I'm getting 126 pounds of nozzle reaction. I go to an inch and eighth smoothbore, at 266 I get 99 pounds. If I drop that nozzle pressure by 10 PSI and I pump that inch and eighth at 40, I get 238 gallons a minute, which I'd say is a pretty acceptable fire stream for a big fire, and I get 79 pounds. That's 50, five zero pounds less nozzle reaction than the 100 PSI fog nozzle. 50 pounds. And again, Dennis tells us, two and a half inch hose, inch and eighth smoothbore at 50 PSI nozzle pressure, generates 99 pounds of reaction force. With training, it's a manageable line to deploy, has good controllability while flowing and while advancing. Why get beat up? Why use a nozzle that makes your job harder? Think about that. If your department is one of those departments that says we have to have a fog nozzle, we, we, are, we will never, if your chief says, I will never allow a smooth bar on a rig in my department. Right on, man. Elkhart Brass, the Elkhart chief, they have 300, I mean, look at that. They have 300 available combinations on that nozzle, including low pressure versions with specifically engineered, calibrated, and labeled stems down to 50 PSI. That 250 at 50 has a nozzle reaction of 85 pounds. And again, think about it. That same, that same exact nozzle, if all you do is change the stem from a 250 at 50 to a 250 at 100, becomes a nozzle that gives you 126 pounds of nozzle reaction. 
and it's the same price. So if you're like me, you hate numbers. It's really easy for me to get up and throw numbers at you. So I'm gonna ask you to think for a second, because I'm sure everybody in this room has handled a two and a half with a 100 PSI fog nozzle. I want you to think, again, that visceral feeling, you know, right here, I want you to think about what that felt like or feels like when you or a partner or maybe you by yourself, when you're leaning into that two and a half and you're trying to hold on to that thing flowing 250 gallons a minute at 100 PSI. So think about that for a second. Then I want you to think about the 150 at 100, right? Most departments, your small target line flow is 150 gallons a minute. Um, a lot of us use automatic nozzles, 100 PSI, okay? That 150 to 100 gives you 76 pounds of reaction force. So again, visceral, think about, think about that feeling of holding that inch and three quarter and what that feels like, okay? That 250 at 50 gives you 85. I'm not a math wizard, that's nine pounds, right? So if you're using a 150 at 100, you can get 100 gallons a minute more for nine pounds. Remember that inch and an eighth pumped at 40 pounds nozzle pressure? I said it gave you a nozzle reaction of what? 79 pounds? Folks, that's three pounds. If, you're, if right now, if your department is using a 150 at 100 on your inch and three quarter, flowing 150 gallons a minute, and you take your two and a half, put an inch and eighth on it, okay, pump that tip at 40 PSI, you're gonna get 238 gallons a minute, and I guarantee you that you will not feel the difference in three pounds. You will feel the nozzle reaction. Now the hose will be bigger and a little heavier, okay, but the kickback in your arms is gonna feel like your inch and three quarter. And again, I'm not saying fog tip smooth bore, if you put that smooth bore 85, right, again, nine pounds. So, I love the saying, right? There is no such thing as a free lunch in this world. If I'm gonna give something, I'm gonna take something and vice versa, okay? So people always say, well, you know, we, we wanna lower our, our, our tip pressure, but the hose is gonna get softer, we're gonna get more kinks. Yeah, that's true, to a point. There's three things that are gonna affect your ability to get kinks. Velocity of water in the stream, Right, keeping the, the velocity up to keep the water moving, and that's done by matching those tip signs like uh, Dennis Laguerre tells us. You know, I don't want a tip that's larger than half the diameter of my hose, right? Um, hose, if you buy junk hose, you're gonna have junk hose. If you buy good hose, you're gonna have good hose and you're probably gonna have less kinks. And your department must, we don't use the word always and never, must a lot in the fire service. I am here to tell you, your department must develop a culture where no one passes a kink. I don't care, like that video that we saw earlier, the fire with the child trap, I don't care if you've been assigned to search and they tell you the kid's in there and you're running up there and you're going up, if you see a hose line with a kink, I am telling you, take the five or 10 seconds to stop and chase it, okay? Kinks kill. Right? And, and again, whether you're using a 100 PSI fog nozzle, a low pressure nozzle, a smooth bore, it doesn't matter, right? Kinks kill. We've got to get that fire cooled down. Chase those kinks. People have also said, well, if I reduce my flow velocity, I'm going to reduce my reach. Okay, that's true. But I have to ask you a question. If your engine company is pulling up at that apartment complex fire, and you're trying to stop that fire in the throat there, and you're gonna operate that line from where those base of those stairs are, does it really matter if you want from a stream that can go 60 feet to 50 feet? Even 45 feet? Does that, is that 10 or 15 feet gonna matter in that scenario? The pallet yard, the warehouse, the big defensive fire where we're gonna start setting up monitors? Yeah, it'd matter. Sit on the thing, make a loop, tie it off, put it in a ground monitor, crank the pressure up, go to town, get the reach, you wanna stay out of the collapse zone. But if I'm using my two and a half aggressively on a fire like this, brothers and sisters, 10 feet, 15 feet of reach, it's not gonna matter because you're operating the line aggressively. And cost, I took this picture off Darley's website a week ago. It's hard to read, 
that tip is $64 and change. So if you already use a, a ball shut off with two and a half base threads and, and inch and a half tip threads and you got 64 bucks, you've got this. People always ask, how do I make this happen, right? I'm kind of the bottom up, you know, the Aaron Fields, boil water from the bottom. Get your people out and flow water. If you take your people out and you put your typical 100 PSI, 250 nozzle on their hands, you have them move around, you set up a little course, maybe you're in your uh, burn building or tower or whatever, have them moving around, well, what do you think? They go, it sucks, we knew that. Right on, try this. And you give them that low pressure tip, if you got it from a vendor, they're not gonna want you to give it back. It's like, oh, dude, I need the nozzle back. We gotta give the demo back. Like, Tell them we lost it, okay? Every time I've trained people with low pressure nozzles on two and a half, so like, can we just keep that, right? And it's like, well, we're working on it. We're getting there, right? No, no, really, we just, we just wanna, we wanna demo it some more. Yeah, sure you do, okay? Start with your people. They're gonna drive it from the bottom up. They're gonna be the ones talking to their company officers, their chiefs, and going, you know, I think it's pretty cool. Can we get a couple of those? So how do we get them? How do we implement this, right? Idea, information, implementation. How do we implement this? Well, first thing we do is we get some nozzles to try out. See Western, our sponsor, they're in the back of the room. If you turn around and walk back there and say, hey, I like John's thing, I wanna demo some nozzles, okay? They're gonna be like, when do you want them? And how many? And what else can we do for you? How about we bring out our truck, because it's got flow meters and pedo gauges, okay? Every time the, the task force demo truck comes out and they roll out the Joey bed on the back with all the nozzles, I want to distract the guy and steal the truck. Because I'm kind of a nozzle geek like that. But they want to come to you. They want to come to you with flow meters. They want to bring experts. They want to give you nozzles to demo. They want you to try this, right? They want you to do it. And then you're going to explore your options. Um, the Task Force Metro Series, when the nozzle comes out of the box, you get a little baggie. It's got about eight or 10 little discs in them. And they're all labeled with different flows and pressures and a little Allen wrench. If you have those metros, it's real easy. Just go back to that baggie and find the low pressure tips. Some nozzles, you can get a hold of the manufacturer and they can either send you a kit to field retrofit the stems to a low pressure, or they'll say, hey, we just need you to send those back to the factory and we'll swap them out with low pressure stamps. Um, if you can't do that, you can always raid, you know the, the museum they have in the front of your station or some of you, or maybe your main station has a museum? You might find, just saying, maybe a half dozen, dozen, inch and an eighth smoothbore, inch and a quarter smoothbore tips that may be sitting on a shelf. You already own them. You got that ball shut off, right? Doesn't cost you a dime and ultimately you may have to go new. But again, think about this. Even if you have to go new, if you're already using a ball shut off, what do you have to buy? A tip, right? You don't need a whole new nozzle, you just need a new tip. And for a lot of the low pressures, especially the fixed gallonage low pressure nozzles, because they really don't have much in the way of moving parts, they're really inexpensive. So just generalizing here, Roughly for the cost of one automatic nozzle, you can usually buy two fixed gallonage nozzles to kind of give you an idea there. Um, and I like them because they're simple. Um, the truth is out there. Andy Fredericks, right, he said, and this is one of my favorite quotes, regardless of when and where a two and a half inch hand line is used, reducing the tip pressure will produce a more manageable nozzle reaction force and facilitate better line movement and handling, okay? People that use these will tell you it, it's night and day going from that high pressure nozzle, that 100 PSI nozzle, to a low pressure nozzle, it's like night and day. It's like using a completely different hose line and all you did was change the tip. Well, I went over by three seconds, so, okay. I want to thank Mike Snodgrass and FireX Talk for again getting it right. You can contact me, uh, it's my phone number. Um, and, and please get out there, at least try it out in your department. I think you're going to like it. Thank you.